but with commitment and consecration. You pledge your loyalty, faithfulness, obedience unto the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for all your people who are here, ready to listen, ready to learn. Thank you for all the other locations where we're hearing your word. Oh Lord, we pray, direct us into the depths of the truth of the word in Jesus' name. And we're asking, oh Lord, that your word will enrich every one of us. Will prepare us for the heavenly glory. Protect us, Lord, as we walk in this way. The way that leads to life eternal. That will not miss our way in Jesus' name. But thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can see now. We come to Matthew chapter 7. And tonight we're looking at verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Just that verse of scripture. And it opens a lot to us, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, to start with. There are people that feel that preachers should only talk positive, encourage people, stir up the hearts and emotional people, almost entertain people, and never speak about anything negative. They think of the warnings of the scripture as negative. They think of when, you are, when we're drawing your attention to danger and we say this, is a place, a point of danger. Beware. Oh, they say that is negative. Other people feel that when you read a verse like this, or when you say anything like this, you are criticizing others. They say in the spirit of unity, in the spirit of love, in the spirit of fellowship, accommodate, tolerate, leave and let others leave. Do what you want to do, and let other people do what they want to do. But here is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Here is our Lord, and He's the shepherd over the sheep. And He knows quite very well that there are people that are teaching the truth, there are people that are teaching error, and that this is an age-long problem. That the false prophets have been there from ages gone by. And at the time of Jesus Christ, they were still there. And after the time of Jesus Christ, into the Acts of the Apostles, into the Epistles, the time of those early leaders of the church, the false prophets will still be there. And until the end of time, until this present moment, the false prophets are still here. That's why the Lord then warned the people. He said, this is a reality. You understand that immediately Adam and Eve got to the Garden of Eden. And God said, this is the way to keep what you have. The treasure that you have. And the possibility, the presence, the power of God, the provision you have in the Garden of Eden. That was the truth. And the way to remain in that fellowship with the Lord is to keep on obeying the word of the Lord. It wasn't long until something else happened. A personality came up and said, As God said, there is always a person, a prophet, a preacher, a personality, trying to contradict the word of the Almighty God. And if you are not careful, you will pay attention to them. You will lend your ears to them. That's why Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you. Oh, you say, I will, I will not go to them. This is my church. And this is the place I learn. I, I, I don't go about. I don't stray here and stray there. It says they will come to you. If you don't come to them, if you don't go to them, they will attempt to dissuade you, persuade you, to go another direction. It says, which come to you is sheep's clothing. And then it says, 
but inwardly the ravening wolves. And so the Lord wants us to understand that yes, there is the positive, there is the negative too. There is the truth, there is error too. There are faithful prophets of God, there are false prophets too. And that we need to be able to look at what we hear, analyze what we hear, match what we hear with the word of God and ask, is this true? Is this according to the word of God? And whatever anybody says, that's always what, how we are to measure. That's how we are to do it. And we are to say, we are going back to the law and to the testimony of the Lord himself. Anybody, no matter the qualification, no matter the popularity, and no matter how sweet or how, how eloquent they may be. If they do not speak according to the word of God, the Bible says, it's because there's no truth in them. In fact, it tells us in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Therefore, the word of God is said to be deceived. And don't think everybody that carries the Bible has something to tell me, has something to say. No, they may say the wrong thing. Everybody that answers the title of a preacher, a pastor, a prophet, has something to reveal to me. No. They may reveal something that is wrong. Everybody that comes with a message from God, from the Almighty, and he says, I pray that fasted and have something, I have a message for you. Everybody that comes with a message has something to tell me. No. They may be revealing something to you that will lead you astray. Because Jesus said, Beware of all those prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. And it says, well, if you're looking at the external, at the exterior, at the appearance, at the eloquence, at what they say, and you don't know what's inside them in their heart, you might take them for real. You might take them to be faithful. You might take them to be the true prophets of God. But it says, inwardly, they're ravening wolves. You see the people that listen to Jesus Christ for the first time. When he said, beware of false prophets, if they were thoughtful, they would have remembered the great evil that the Old Testament prophets, that they, they caused in the land of Israel. Because to see Israel as a nation, knew the great evil that the prophets did to their kings, to the whole nation. The, the spiritual blindness of the whole nation was the result and the consequence of the blindness and the hardness of heart of their prophets, their teachers, and their leaders. The disobedience of the children of Israel, the rebellion of the children of Israel, and then the judgment that came upon them in form of captivity and prolonged suffering. All those things that came upon the nation, they were caused by the false prophets in the land. While they were out of the right way, and they were going the wrong direction, and they were now in the broad way, in the way of corruption, in the way of the pagans, in the way of the heathens. Their false prophets were showing them that everything was all right. They were still okay. There was nothing wrong with them. And the few prophets that rose up, like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, those false prophets, they denounced them. They said, I don't mind them. Harsh prophets, cruel prophets. Prophets of doom, prophets of judgment, and they labeled them as people that nobody should listen to. But actually, those false prophets destroyed the people. When those faithful prophets rose up to call them back to the narrow way, that is to the way of righteousness and to the way of life, the false prophets hardened their hearts to continue in the broad way of sin. What did he tell them? What he said, there's peace for everybody. God created us. And he loves us. And he's too kind and too gentle and too loving to put punishment on anybody. That God is so nice, he's so kind, whoever we are. He knows our frailty. He knows our problem. 
He knows we cannot obey the commandments of God. Don't feel guilty. He said, discard your guilt. Condemnation. Let there be no guilt or condemnation in your heart. Don't listen to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, to Isaiah, to all these other people. They don't have any other thing to do. That's why they're just prophets of doom. And he told them there will be peace for everybody. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6. I'm reading verse 13 and verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 6. Verse 13 and verse 14. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, every one dealeth falsely. You see that? The prophet and the priest, they were dealing falsely. They were not sincere. They only told the people what they wanted to hear. Uh, you know, there are times we don't want to hear some things. That's natural to the people who are, do, who are going the wrong way. And they don't want anybody to challenge them because the evil will is convenient to them. And they don't want any prophet, any preacher, any pastor coming to them and disturbing them. But the message of repentance, turn around. But isn't that what we need? You know, when we're sick, the medicine may look bitter. And nobody likes to swallow any bitter pill. But that's exactly what we need. And if somebody will come to us and say, don't mind that doctor. All he has is all this bitter pill. I have some chocolate for you. And I have some sweet, sweet things for you. Oh, say, that's my friend. That's your enemy. He wants to kill you. That's, that's a killer. That's a murderer. It's a, right, it's a true prophet that brings the message from God. And he says, this may look bitter. It's bitter for a moment now. But you know, it will preserve you from destruction and damnation in, in the great beyond. That's the true prophet. Look at verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. That's what the false prophets did. That's what they said. That's how they spoke. Peace, peace, and yet there was no peace. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11. Jeremiah 8, 11. For they have healed the hurt. Of the got of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look at Ezekiel chapter 13. In Ezekiel chapter 13, you still find the same thing. As you look at verse 10, Ezekiel 13, 10. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. You see, that's what the prophets, if you listen to many, many people, there's no message of repentance. There's no warning. And they don't alert the people of the coming judgment. They don't remind us that the axe is laid at the foot of the tree. And every tree that does not bring forth good fruit, or they cut down and cast into the fire. Awake! Turn, turn ye, O house of Israel, for why will ye die? They don't remind us, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Everything is just peace, peace, soothing message, comforting message. For those who are in the wrong way, and yet the Lord is saying, judgment is coming. Do you know the effect of the message of those false prophets on the children of Israel in those days? The same chapter 13 of Ezekiel verse 22. Ezekiel 13 verse 22. Because of lies, have you made the heart of the righteous sad? With lies, have you made the heart of the righteous sad? You know, they said all that righteousness is just punishing himself. It's not necessary. All that walking in the narrow way, being narrow-minded, old-fashioned, all that is not necessary. All that strict righteousness and keeping according to the word of God, I can't do this, I can't do that. That man does not have any liberty. That's what they say. And they make the heart of the righteous sad. And then it says, 
in that uh, verse 22, because what lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. That's what he did. For the people who are wicked, for the people that the Lord was saying, repent. If you continue in sin, you will perish. He said, don't listen to that. Everything will be all right at the edge. They say many roads lead to Rome. And many paths will lead to that heaven. They say some people believe in holiness. Other people believe in joy and happiness. Other people believe in worship. Other people believe in just have a nice time. Just believe the Lord. Raise up your hand and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, everybody will be all right. That's what it was saying. And it is not so. And the Lord is saying that these false prophets that is strengthening the hands of the evildoers that they will not return from the evil who are promising them life instead of reminding them they are on the way of death. Beware of false prophets who have been reaching on the sky above the nation of Israel for all to read and for them to remember constantly. Hey, do you know what the false prophets of Israel did? To the children of Israel in the Old Testament, number one, he made them lose the blessing of Abraham. Now, God said, I'm going to bless Abraham and all your descendants. But when those people went astray and the false prophets encouraged them to remain in that evil way, they lost the blessing of Abraham. Number two, the covenant blessings were no longer theirs. The covenant blessings, I'll give you peace, I'll bless your land, I'll bless everything, you'll be the head, you'll not be the tail, they lost that. Number three, they were under the brutal rule of a foreign nation. The Kanesa came and carried them all away and destroyed the city and burnt Jerusalem with fire because of the effect of what those false prophets did. Number four, there was spiritual blindness among their leadership. Until the time that Jesus came, the spiritual blindness was still there. They were blind. They couldn't see. They couldn't even see that Christ was the Messiah. Number five, the glory, the past glory of Israel had departed with no hope of restoration in view. Number six, the nation had been trodden down under the feet of the Gentiles. Number seven, they were slaves and captives in their own land. Why? All because of the sustained influence of false prophets. Now Christ had come in fulfillment of the long-awaited promise. The Lord had said, the Lord God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Unto him ye shall hack him. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now Jesus Christ had come in fulfillment of that promise of God. And now he told them, this is the way, walk ye in it. And immediately now he said, please, now that I show you the narrow way that leads unto life, there are the false prophets just like they came in the olden days. And that's why he said, the wear of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly the ravening wolves. As we look at that verse, the study tonight, and the study itself is just simply titled, the wear of false prophets. It's divided to three parts. Number one, the history. Number two, the hypocrisy. Number three, the heartlessness of the false prophets. Number one, the history of false prophets. It has a long, long history, those false prophets. As you go to the Old Testament and then you're looking at where are the false prophets? They're everywhere. In the Pentateuch, that is Genesis to Deuteronomy, they were there. As you come to the book of the Joshua Judges for Samuel and all that and the kings, they appeared again. As you come to the Chronicles, you find them again, the false prophets. And now you come to the time of the prophets proper. 
Isaac, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they are there. At the time of Amos, they were there. And then you come all the way to the end of Malachi. In the Old Testament, you'll find them there. The false prophets. That's why Jesus said they have been there for thousands of years. They have not all died. They're still there. Beware of false prophets. The history of false prophets. Number two, the hypocrisy. You see how they come? They come as the gentle people, gentle men. In sheep's clothing, nice, soft, soothing, comforting, encouraging, happy, joyful, excited. And then they call you to say, come on, come and worship. And don't just sit down there and, you know, be so narrow-minded, thinking you are going to heaven, so gloomy and so sad. Cheer up. That's how they say it. Now, it says, they're just hypocrites because they have sheep's clothing. But in what they are ravening wolves. Then, number three is the heartlessness of the false prophets. Ravening wolves. They'll destroy. They'll tear. They'll devour. They don't have any mercy. And they know that you want to get to heaven. You put everything you have on the line. Oh, Lord, all I want is to get to heaven. And yet they're going to deceive you because they are heartless. They don't care whether you suffer eternally or not. All they want is your money now. Beware of false prophets which come to you. It sheep's clothing. But inwardly, the ravening wolves. Let's come to number one, the history of false prophets. Let's come to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly the ravening wolves. We're looking at the history of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he scratched the way into the kingdom very clearly. From the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he had spoken as the prophet, whom the Lord your God shall raise up unto you. History often repeats itself. What does that mean? What happened in the past generation also happens in this generation. What happened in the Old Testament happens also in the New Testament. What happened at the early time of the church? The early church also happens at this latter time of the church. History often repeats itself. There were true and faithful prophets in the Old Testament, but they were outnumbered by the false prophets. They were faithful prophets. Do you remember the time of Elijah? A faithful prophet, a truthful prophet, a dependable, committed, loyal prophet. Yet the prophets of Baal were in their hundreds. And they all opposed and contradicted Elijah. All the time in the Old Testament, the false prophets always outnumbered the true prophets. Take note of that. In the days in which we live today, when you think about all the preachers, all the prophets, all the proclaimers, all the gospelers, you'll find that the false outnumber the true. The people who are teaching false doctrine, erroneous doctrine, those who never touch. Repentance, righteousness, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The people on the other side who are not telling the whole truth that leads us into the kingdom, they outnumber the people who teach, who preach the truth. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the King, the Prophet, the Priest, He now spoke to everyone and to the whole nation. He declared the whole truth concerning the only way to God. What will the response of his listeners be? These people that gathered around that mountain, and they were hearing the message from the Lord himself. What was going to be their response? What would be their decision? Would they enter through the straight gate and persevere in the narrow way until the end? Or will they allow themselves to be deceived by the false prophets again and then be lost forever? As it was in the Old Testament, so it was at the time of Christ. And so shall it be until the end of time. 
the false prophets have always outnumbered the faithful prophets, and their influence had always been great, almost irresistible. That's why the Lord said, beware, 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 beware of false prophets. The false prophets of the Old Testament had an easy access to the kings and he wielded national influence. If you read the Old Testament very well, you will see the false prophets, anytime they could go to the palace of the king, they were free, they were supported, they were sponsored by the kings and the, and the princes of the land. But the false prophets, while the, while the false prophets were in the palace, the faithful prophets were in the prison, in prison Jeremiah. They contradicted Isaiah, and they neglected and rejected Ezekiel and all the true prophets. Meanwhile, all those who are preaching false, false, sweet things, they had easy access to the king of princes of those times. If you're looking for popularity and you're looking for being very near the king and the palace, you'll soon become a false prophet. Because you see those kings of the Old Testament, they, never, they didn't want the truth. All they wanted was a falsehood that those false prophets were giving to them. If they gave in to the false prophets again, that this, these people that Jesus was talking to, they would miss a great restoration and remain in spiritual blindness and captivity for thousands of years. Exactly that is what has happened unto Israel. All those people that listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, Beware of false prophets. The Pharisees told the people, Don't mind him. He has Beelzebub. He's a prince of devils that is walking and speaking through him. We are the people that are telling the truth. Those are the false prophets. And he deceived those people until the people said, Crucify him. They destroyed the faithful Son of God. And then they held on to. They are false prophets. And the Lord is saying, Beware so that that does not happen to you. And let's look at this history we're talking about. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Moses was faithfully telling the people that I'm giving you the truth. I'm showing you the true way for the false people will come. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go out of the gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dream of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of a house of bondage, or thrust you out of the way, out of the way, out of the way. That's what, what false prophets do. That's why they do what they do. That's why they say what they say. They want to turn you away from the way that the Lord has put your feet in. He says, so shall you put evil away from the midst of the... You see so early in the history of the children of Israel that this man of God was warning them, Moses, before he left, he said, those dreamers will come, those false prophets will come, and he'll try to thrust you away out of the way which I put your feet in. Isaiah chapter 28. Verse 7, the history of the false prophets. Isaiah 28, verse 7, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are they out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. Now already you can begin to tell, they don't care, alcohol, strong drink, 
had drugs, illegitimate things. They don't care about that. All they do is just preach. All they do is just prophesy. All they do is just deceive people. As for strong drink, they're for age. Whatever the world is drinking, they drink. Whatever the world is doing, they do. And whatever the world is entertaining themselves with, that's what they entertain themselves with. And it says the priest and the, and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are, they are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. You see that? They are out of the way. If somebody is out of the way, how can he lead you in the right way? Those false prophets, that's their history. That's what they were in the past, and that's what they are still today. Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're looking at verse 8. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8, here is what the Lord is telling us about these prophets. He tells us in verse 8. The priests said not, where is the Lord? They don't care about the Lord. All they want is, you know, they already know what to do. They can do everything they want to do without even opening the Bible. They can preach what they want to preach without giving attention to the Lord to be at the center of everything they say. They don't care about the word of God, about the law of God about the demand of God, about the desires of the Lord. They don't care about the kingdom of God. And God is not at the center of their goal, of their dream, of their purpose, of their ministry, of their worship. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. That is, those who are not even born again. They do not know the Lord in any way, and they try to handle the word of God. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and watch after things that do not profit. But you see, the average man, the common man who goes to church, may not know that. We don't know their lives during the week. Once they come and they dress like preachers, like pastors, like evangelists, we do not know their inner lives and their lack of understanding. And if they're able to stand up and demonstrate and dramatize and then just get you interested and get the people to clap and to smile and every, every, everybody thinks everything is all right. But he says, he prophesied by Baal. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ is telling the people who are interested in getting to heaven, beware of false prophets. They come to you, the sheep's clothing, but you worldly, the remaining wolves. It tells us in chapter 5 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 30 and verse 31. A horrible thing, a terrible thing, a wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. You see that? The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. God was surprised that these were descendants of Abraham. And they had had the word of the Lord for generations, centuries, and many years. Now, they went into all these assemblies, and then the prophets and the priests will come and prophesy by Baal, and the priests will rule by their means. That is, by their means, what that means is that they have their own law now, their do's and don'ts, their principles, and they say, this is our tenet of faith. And everything, they abandon the word of God. They abandon what God has said. All that the Bible says, does says the Lord, does says the Lord. They abandon that one. They said it's a modern time. It's a, it's a new time, a new era, a new dispensation. Who wants to know what the Bible says? They said that's not for today. And then they now prophesy and preach by their means. And then the surprising thing is, and my people love to have it so. Nobody, nobody says, but this is not the Bible. This is not the word of God. They just support and encourage those false prophets. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests 
they are ruled by their means, and my people love to have it so. I pray you will not be among them. But looking at Lamentation chapter 2, Lamentation chapter 2, Lamentation is the mourning, the crying, the weeping of the true prophet saying, things are bad, things have gone rotting, things are terrible. And look at the situation of the people of God today. And everything is because of the false prophets, because of the false teaching of those and many preachers and many prophets. Lamentation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. The prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. The prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. Uh, have you noticed that, you know, many of these, uh, they call them, whatever name they call them, I'm not particular about anyone or anybody, but you know, uh, there's so many churches, and there's so many assemblies, and there's so many fellowships, and all it is just prophesy a word of the Lord for you, a word of the Lord for you. And, and the people, the men and the women, you know, they rush to them. You have a word for me from the Lord, you have a word for me from the Lord, and the fellow has nothing. And the fellow is not going to even quote the Bible to them. And the fellow will just say, you know, something nice that the fellow wants to hear. That's, that's not Christianity. And that's what the Lord is saying here in verse 14. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee. They have not discovered thine iniquity. Look at all the teeming multitudes going to different churches and going to different conventions and different places of worship today. They never tell the people about their sin, about their iniquity. Never. It says over here, they have not discovered their iniquity to turn away their captivity, but have seen for the false bodies and causes of banishment. All that pass by clasp their hands at thee. The heels and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies of enemies have opened their mouths against thee. The heels and gnash the tears. They say, We have swallowed her up. Certainly, this is the day that we look for. We have found and we have seen it. Isn't the devil saying that? That he has swallowed up the church, the big church. That he is the church, the church in the nation. And the devil is saying, although the meetings multiply, places of worship multiply, but the truth is diminishing. And the people who are going to heaven, they're diminishing. And it says over here, the enemies are rejoicing. And they're saying, we have found, we have swallowed her up. Certainly, this is the day that we look for. We have found and we have seen it. The Lord has done that which he has devised. He has fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and he has not pitied. He has caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He has set up the harm of thine adversaries. Not just because of those false prophets. I pray God will deliver us. I say God will deliver us. We're looking at point number two now. As we come to point number two, we're looking at the hypocrisy of false prophets. The false prophets, a, a lot of hypocrisy. Come back to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. That's the hypocrisy. Inwardly, they are dangerous, destructive, damning, ravening wolves. But outwardly, they have the put on sheep's clothing. Hypocrisy and deception were, common, were the common marks of the false prophets in ancient times. The average man who saw the appearance of the false prophet to be similar to that of the true prophet, look no farther, I was easily deceived. You know, somebody comes to you, he comes with a Bible in the hand, and he smiles, and he carries himself in a dignified way, 
and he says hallelujah praise the lord jesus is my lord jesus is savior and he says it in such a nice way you don't even want to think about his character about his creed about his doctrine you don't want to think about any other thing the man is so nice and then the man says can i pray for you and then he gives you some testimonies and he says this happened and this happened and this happened you're swallowed you're sucked in without wanting to find out this man that looks so nice externally inwardly what does he look like this man that looks so gentle so accommodating so tolerant and so loving and so nice and so inviting and then everything external looks so good what you see on the inside that's what you need to find out they come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly the red mean wolves and that's the hypocrisy and the deception and the average person will not be able to tell the difference between the false prophet and the true prophet the false prophets worship building as if they were true prophets of god and their followers did not know that inwardly they were reading wolves do you know that's what the lord wants us to always check up what goes on on the inside and you'll find you know, somebody and sometimes somebody is talking so nice and everything looks so good and then you'll say this looks like what i believe this looks like you know what we have been taught all these years and then you say praise the lord it looks like it's not really our church that is teaching the truth and then maybe in the next uh, sentence is going to make then you say say well uh, you know god is so loving he you know put off his other wife and now he has uh, this second wife and and having such a wonderful time together praying together fasting together fellowshipping together then you're short you say but look at this man who was talking so nice i thought we just believe the same thing and now he's talking about another thing that's what you need to be aware and to be very careful the way of false prophets which come to you is she is clothing inwardly that's what you look at inwardly the exterior the outward life is very different from the inward life from the internal and look at luke chapter 11 luke chapter 11 i'm reading from verse 39 luke chapter 11 verse 39 and the lord said unto him now do ye pharisees make clean the outside of the car and the platter but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness inward part inward part inward part they are in a lie. That's what we need to look at. Matthew chapter 23. We're looking at verse 25. Matthew 23, verse 25. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within, that's it. Within, they are full of extortion and excess. In verse 27, warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are like unto whited sepulchre, which indeed, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of deadness, bones, and of all uncleanness. When you, when you go by, when you pass by a cemetery, you don't look at what is inside. You don't see all those well painted and whitewashed uh, tombs. You think this is nice, this is good. But you know, on the inside, everything is stinking. Verse 28, even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The Lord wants us to look beyond the exterior. And you know, that's, that's another thing we need to look at. There are some people that all they look at is the outward. And sometimes you'll find some young people and those young people will say I, when i get older i don't think i want to continue with deeper life and you say what's your problem i don't like the way we look on the outside when you look at all the other churches and you get in there 
and you see how the people, how they carry themselves, and then you see how their preachers are, and you see how the ladies, those sisters there, how they dress, they say, I like that, that's how it was, that's how it was. And then when you look at their music and you look at the singers when they come, or they say, you know, our own singers, they just come and they pick the mic there and they just stand there and they just sing. But you know, when you go to those people, you see how those singers dress. And then you see how they, they first of all talk to the congregation, praise the Lord today. We're going to worship the Lord together. And then they demonstrate and they walk up and down. And then you open your mouth, you open your eyes, you say, what? And then the fellow then, you know, the organ, the guitar, and everything begins to play. And then the fellow begins to sing. And then carries the whole congregation. You see, when I get out of home and I'm no more under my parents, that is the church. I'm going to go to. Why? Because of the external thing. External thing. Inwardly, a revenue wolves. You don't want to have, you don't want to have somebody that will deceive you into the broad way just because they have a nice exterior. But inwardly, you do not have the right doctrine that will take you to life eternal. I pray God will watch over us. And we will not be lost in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 5, I'm reading verse 9. Psalm 5, verse 9. In Psalm 5, verse 9, we're still talking about the exterior and the interior. For David, uh, Psalm 5, verse 9, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their inward part, inward part, inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongue. Just the flattery, the flattery with their tongue. That's the external thing that you see. But the inward part, that is very much wickedness. How do you see that? Deception is always dangerous. But it is most dangerous and damning when the way to hell is mistaken for the way to heaven. The messages of the false prophets were fatally deceptive. The messages of the false prophets fatally deceptive. In fact, the Bible says that over and over. The false prophets prophesy falsely. Another passage says, from the prophet even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Another passage says, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. They prophesy lies, but they will not say, now, I'm saying this from Satan, never. They never accept that they are influenced by Satan. They say they have the Spirit of God. They might even give you testimony. When they are filled and baptized and saturated with the Spirit of God. And then they say, I tell you now. Then they begin to say, God says the Lord. And it says, in the name of the Lord. And yet it's a lie, falsehood, deception, damnable error, falsehood. That's why you need to be careful. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. The prophets walk in lies. Let not your prophets deceive you, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. You see, the effect of the deception and the hypocrisy of the false prophets was terrible and devastating on every individual and all the families of the whole land of Israel. For many centuries, even until this generation. And look at what the Bible says concerning the effect of what they preach and what they said. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8 again. Jeremiah chapter 2. Looking at verse 8 again. It says in verse 8, the priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. How can somebody who does not know the Lord make you to know the Lord? How does somebody who is blind make you see? How can somebody who does not know the way point the way to you? And then it goes on in that verse 8. It says that the pastors have also transgressed against me. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's not good to go into sin. Let's say, for example, somebody goes into sin and is struggling and is hiding it. And he doesn't want the church here to know. 
Because uh, he knows that if the church knows, they will rebuke him. How could you do that? He might even be disciplined. And because he's trying away from the temporary challenge, so we can put him right and go the right way. He says, I will go to another place. And then he goes to another church. And this the last Sunday he was with us. The following Sunday you find him in another place. And then the other fellow there, the preacher there, the pastor there, the prophet there is preaching. And he says, you know, we welcome everybody. And then he says, whatever you have done, don't you mind. Even those of them who are preaching there, that she know that you, nobody can live above sin. And if the Lord will mark iniquity, will stand. And he says, we are all sinners, whether preacher or prophet or member, anybody, it's only by the mercy and the grace of God we can, we can breathe. Everybody is sinning. And you are sitting down there, then you feel comforted. Oh, this is not like my, the church I'm coming from. This one is comforting. This one looks like this one will make me live an easy life. Yes, an easy life that will bring destruction. Because the prophets themselves, it says they transgress. And the prophets prophesied there. And then the last line says, and they walk after things that do not profit. They walk after things that will not profit you. That's why I need to get out of that place very quickly. They are out of the way. They will not be able to lead you in the right way. Isaiah chapter 28 again verse 7. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 7. But you also have ears through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have ears through strong drink. The prophets, they have ears through strong drink. They are out of the way, out of the way, out of the way. You know, it's not just that you know, I'm going to church. It's not just that I'm going to, you know, Bible study somewhere. I'm going to prayer meeting somewhere. What if they have gone out of the way? Is the Lord going to reward you just going to prayer meeting and the leadership there has gone out of the way? Is the Lord going to say, well done, because you're attending fellowship. Oh, I never miss fellowship. I never miss fellowship. Yes, I understand. But the person is leading you in that fellowship, if he has gone out of the way, what profit is that? That's this you need to check up in uh, chapter two, in chapter nine of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter nine. I'm reading verse fifteen. Isaiah chapter nine, verse fifteen. The ancient and the honourable, he is the head, the prophet that teaches lies. He is the tail, the prophet that teaches lies. You know, it's not just uh, to say, you know, some people, they leave us here, they say, I want to go to Bible school. And then we say, what do you want to go and do there? I want to be able to have a, a certificate in theology. What do you know they're teaching? If they're teaching you lies there, and then you get a certificate on the basis of learning lies. The certificate is useless. You know, sometimes some people will, and they will be, let's say, their leaders in our church. I don't mean Lagos here, anywhere. We have many churches and many leaders. And then they just begin to, I want to develop myself. I want to grow. I don't want to just, you know, stay like this. And I don't have any certificate. I don't have any degree in theology. I think I want to go to, you know, Bible school somewhere. And then they go to that Bible school, they leave us, and they say, I'm not living deeper life, I'm still part of the church. Only I want to get theological certificate, training. And then they've gone over there. And then over there they tell them all those lies of eternal security. You are saved and forever saved. Even if you sin, if you die in sin, never mind. God is so nice and still going to take you to heaven. And then they write their exams on eternal security and all those other things. And then they get certificate. Then they come back to us and they say, I'm, I'm back. Can I have a church to pastor? I will say, where did you go? I went to learn. Now I'm ready to teach. What are you going to teach? The lies they taught you over there. There's no place for teaching lies here. It says over here in that verse 15, it says the prophet that teaches lies, he is a tale. 
Be very careful that you are not under a teacher, under a leader that is teaching lies. In Jeremiah chapter 28, Jeremiah chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee off from up the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. You know, it's not every teacher that is teaching us to be faithful, to be loyal, to be obedient, and to follow the narrow path that leads to heaven. There are some people that are teaching rebellion against the word of the Lord. That simply means they're teaching false doctrine. And they're teaching something contrary to the truth of the word of God. Those are the false prophets. They are hypocritical. They're very dangerous. Chapter 29, Jeremiah 29, verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah, the Nehelamite, and his seed. He shall not have a man to dwell among his, this people. Neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. It's not everybody that is teaching that you think will teach the truth. There are people that teach error. Falsehood, deception, damnable error, and it teach rebellion against the Lord. I read this before in Ezekiel. I'll read it again. Ezekiel chapter 13. In Ezekiel chapter 13, we're looking at verse 22. Because with lies, he hath made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. What does that mean? You know, somebody has been saved, and he has the grace of God, and the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and justly, unblameably in this present world. And that fellow, by the grace of God, is living, is watching his tale, is very careful, and is making sure that he matches his life with the watch of God. And then one day he goes to maybe in the church, in the city where he went, and there is no, no church, no regular church that he has been attending there. And he goes to this other church, and then the preacher comes. And then he looks at all the people. And then he, while he's preaching, he says, ah, How many of you here say you are believers and you don't commit sin? And that you are holy, you are righteous, you have the grace of God in your life. And every day you're living a righteous life. And then the preacher says, where are you? Raise up your hand. And then the, the brother thought that he was a genuine preacher, a genuine pastor, wanting to encourage him. And wanting to encourage the congregation, saying that, you see, it's possible to live a righteous life. And then the brother raises up his hand, he looks around, and he's in the one raising up his hand. And then the pastor says, stand up. Where are you coming from? Okay, you are new here today. Ah, no wonder you raise up your hand. You know, anybody who says it's not committing sin is a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You're committing sin. Didn't you march on an ant or you were coming? That's a sin. Didn't you look at uh, women like this? Well, that's a sin. And didn't you sit down beside uh, a lady when you were coming to church today? That's a sin. What do you say you're not committing sin? Everybody's a sinner. Sit down. You know, and that, that brother felt so sad. Why did I come to this place? Why didn't you, since my church is not in town, why didn't I just stay in, the, in my room and just, and just read my Bible and just listen to a cassette? That's what the Lord is saying, that those prophets, false prophets, they make the righteous sad whom I have not made sad. And then look at that verse 22, and they strengthen the hands of the wicked, that they should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And then that pastor will tell the rest of the people, everybody, I'm, I'm happy with you, the interest of your hand. Everybody is a sinner. After you are saved, and after you are in the Lord, doesn't matter how many years you are in the Lord, everybody is a sinner. And then we'll tell them to repeat after him, I am a sinner. And everybody will say, I am a sinner. 
All right, now the grace of God is available for every one of you. Keep on singing and keep on enjoying the grace of God. Such people will never think of repenting. Because they have public encouragement to continue in sin. And that's what the Lord is saying, that those false prophets, they encourage and strengthen the hands of the evil doers to keep on doing evil, and they promise them life. I pray you will not be like that. Give me a good amen. amen. Jeremiah chapter 14. In Jeremiah chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 14, reading from verse 13. Then said I, our Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see such, neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you a short peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not. That means they were deceivers. I sent them not. And then he says, Neither speak unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a sin of naught, and the deceit of their own hearts. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I send them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and by famine shall those prophets be consumed. And that's why you need to watch and be very careful. Micah chapter 3. In Micah chapter 3, we're reading from verses 11 and 12. Micah chapter 3, verse 11. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the prophets thereof teach for hire. The prophets thereof divine for money. The divine for money. The prophets, the preachers. They do what they do because of money. And then there are some people, if another church, local church, will pay them more than what they have in the present church, they'll quit the present church and go to the other church. It's where you have the bigger pay, the bigger money. That's where they want you to go. They are not interested in the people who want the truth, who want to go to heaven. All they want is where they'll be able to get a bigger pay. And then it says, the prophets divine for money. Yet will you lean upon the will, yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us non evil can come upon us? And then he tells us in verse twelve, therefore shall Zion for your sakes be ploughed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Now we come to point number three, the heartlessness of the false prophets. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. There's a warning. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, their hypocrisy, their deception. But inwardly, their ravening woes. That's their heartlessness. Inwardly. The ravening wolves. We're looking at Jeremiah. Uh, see what the Lord Himself called these prophets, and see the wickedness, the cruelty, and the murderous nature that they have. They exhibit, they demonstrate. In Jeremiah chapter four, verse nine, and it shall come to pass at that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes. And the priest shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Verse 10, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people, and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas sword reaches unto the soul. The souls were about to perish, but the prophets came, they said they came from the, from the Lord. 
Some people, some of them will say, I've been waiting upon the Lord. And they will say they have fasted for seven days or 21 days or 40 days. And now they have not even tasted anything and they have got message for the people. And when they deliver what they call the message, it's deceptive and destructive. And that's what Jeremiah is saying here, that these people, Oh Lord, did you speak to them? Have they not been deceived? Because the prophets and the proclaimers and the preachers said, They will have peace, whereas the sword reaches unto the soul. Chapter 23 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, I'm reading from verse 9. Jeremiah 23, verse 9. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, and like a man whom wine has overcome, because of the Lord, and because of the words of his holiness. Here is Jeremiah, a lonely prophet. And there wasn't any other prophet at the time of Jeremiah that was supporting him. And you know, the first prophets were saying, you think that only one person will be right, and every other person wrong? Only one person will be telling us that, you know, God is going to bring judgment because of our sin. And then one Nebuchadnezzar somewhere will come from Babylon and come and put this city, this great city Zion, the beauty of the nation, and set it on fire. Don't mind him. And then, uh, do, you, do you think that only one person, only one Jeremiah, only one lone prophet, lone ranger, that doesn't have anything to do with anybody, he is the only one that will be telling us, God said, God said, God is going to bring judgment, God mind him. And so, Jeremiah said, my bones shake. I'm troubled, I tremble, because of the word of his holiness. In, in verse 10, for the land is full of adulterers, for because of the swearing, the land mourns, the present places of the wilderness are dried up, and their cause is evil, and their force is not right. That's Jeremiah, telling us that, you know, all those prophets deceiving them, they were heartless. They were not thinking of the good of the people at all. Lamentation chapter 4. In Lamentation chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. Lamentation chapter 4, verse 12. The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. And it's because of the false prophets that deceived the people and told them, continue in sin. God is kind, God is loving. You remember, you remember Abraham, even if you are not doing right, are you not the son of Abraham? Are you not the child of Abraham? Even if you are not doing well, are we not descendants of Abraham? Because of our link, our relationship with Abraham, it doesn't matter what we do. Whatever we do, Abraham's faithfulness and righteousness will cover us. And then eventually, because of that, enemies came and devoured devastated the land, destroyed the land. And Jeremiah looking at the whole land, the devastation, the destruction, and the, the, the terrible things that came upon them because of their sin. And then he said, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world in all the nations around, they would never have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. For the sins of our prophets, and the iniquity of our priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. And then he goes on and says, they cried unto them, depart ye, it is unclean, depart, depart, touch not. When he fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, they shall no more sojourn there. It's like they were destroyed and there was no remedy. It says in verse 16, the anger of the Lord has divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the presence of the priests. They favored not the elders. And then he tells us in Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah chapter 27. We're looking at verse 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 27, verse 15. For I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy 
a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Do you see that? It's not everybody that says, thus says the Lord. I had a word from the Lord. God sent me to come and tell you something. It's not everyone like that that is telling the truth. These people just tell lies without blinking an eye, without worrying at all. After all, they don't believe in righteousness and holiness. They just, they just trade in lies and deception. And it says, I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that she might perish, ye, and the prophets that prophesy those lies unto you. And then he tells us in verse 16, Also I spake to the priests and to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Hearken not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. Jeremiah chapter 32, the heartlessness of the prophets. He knew that the people were facing the judgment of God, and instead of encouraging the people to repent and to return to the Lord, and he just told them, just go, go on doing what you are doing, everything will be all right, finally, at the end. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 32. Here the word of God reminds us again about the heartlessness of these the false prophets because of all the evil of the children of Israel. And of the children of Judah, which they have done to, prov to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. You see that? A prophet, some people, they just turn their back unto the Lord. They say, God, you want to speak, we don't want to listen to you. And it's when you want to listen to somebody, you are just the way you are, and you face them. I want to listen. I'm hearing what you're saying. But these people turn the back and not the face. Though I touch them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hacking to receive instruction. Verse 34. But they search the abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel now becomes, he actually he uses the language of Jesus Christ, calling them lion, ravening wolves. Look at it. In Ezekiel chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel 22, verse 25. There's the conspiracy of our prophets in the midst thereof. Like a running lion ravening a prey. They have devoured souls. It's not just that they destroy the bodies, they devour souls. You know, sometimes uh, if you evaluate uh, people by, you know, how they make you happy and how they get you to get healed, how they talk about faith, how they talk about having this material thing and buying a car and building a house, if you evaluate preachers on that basis, and you're not thinking of the error they're preaching, and the dagger they put in your soul, and the destruction they put in your soul. It says over here, in this verse 25, it says, they have devoured souls. Whatever blessing they give you in your body, whatever kind of temporary relief you have, that's nothing if your soul is destroyed. It says they have devoured the souls, they have taken the treasure, the precious things, they have made how many widows in the midst thereof. Then he says in verse 26, a priest have violated my law. A priest, the leaders, they violated the law of the Lord. And they have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed the difference between the clean and the unclean. They just mumble everything together, mix everything together. Everybody is all right. Clean, unclean, holy, unholy, righteous, unrighteous. Everybody were going to the same place. That's what they say. But it's deception. And then he tells us, it says, And I've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I'm profane among them. Are princes in the midst thereof are like wolves raving in the prey, and shed to shed blood, 
and to destroy souls. To destroy souls. You see, that's what we'll be looking for. What does prophets preach? What does preachers preach? What does pastors emphasize? Does it help any soul to come alive in Christ? Or is it just destroying them? Making people to go from bad to worse? And the people that were living moderate Christian lives before righteous lives before, they get into those places, then they become careless. And they just feel that, you know, there's no reason to be careful to watch and to pray and to resist temptation and to live a righteous life. After all, everybody is getting to the same way eventually. And that's why it says, they destroy souls to get dishonest gain. I pray that they will not catch you. I said they will not catch you. But that means that you will not go in their direction. Because if you go the direction of a false prophet, and then you open your ears and open your eyes, you listen to their tapes and read their books, and then say, they will not catch you. When you deliberately put yourself in the trap, they will not catch you. In 1 Kings, we're looking at it from chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, the child shall be born unto the house of David Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that are born incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign that the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his son from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his son, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. This was a real child of God, a man of God. The Lord sent him to come and tell this king the real truth. And the king did not like the truth. So he stretched out his hand and said, Take him. Take hold of him. And his hand dried up. The Lord will protect you. That anybody that wants to catch you for standing for the truth, saying the truth, preaching the truth, the Lord will deal with them. And then in verse 5, And the altar also was raised, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. That's a great man of God. He didn't have any grudge, any bitterness, any hatred against the king for wanting to hurt him. He prayed for him. God answered. His son was restored again. Verse 7. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. That's how you know a true man of God. Not professing because of money, not preaching because of money, not praying for people because of money. It's a real man of God. And then he, he said, He will not return with the king in verse 9, for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the way, in, by the way that thou camest. And he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Brethren, look up for a moment. You know, look at this man of God. He was alone. No partner. No wife. With him. I didn't say he was not married, but his wife was not with him. And partners in ministry were not with him. Alone he came. Alone he declared the word of God unto the king. That's how you know a true prophet of God. 
You see, there are many, there are many leaders of the world today, kings, presidents, and leaders. And if we are true prophets of God, their position, their stature will not change our message, will not modify the message, will declare the message of the word of God as the Lord has spoken it. And you will not be afraid of the face of man. And you know they have the power, they could hurt you. That's why the king stretched out and said, take hold of him. Somebody that sees me like this standing here as the king of the land. And he could tell me that kind of prophecy. I'm going to deal with him. God will protect us. And so they looked down to the king and the king said, ah, Looks like this is not an ordinary prophet. Please pray for me. And he prayed for him. And then the son came again. And now, you know, if the, if the devil does not catch you through persecution, he'll try to catch you through prosperity. You know, the devil is very wise. If he cannot catch you by putting some pain and pressure on you, he'll catch you by easy lie. He'll give you a gift. And he says, okay, man, I will not fight you again. It looks like you're a good man of God. Thank you for praying for me. Now, come home with me and refresh yourself and eat and drink. And the man said, no. Can you reject gift? Can you reject money? Can you reject worldly favor? Because, you know, the gifts will shut your mouth. Once you begin to, you know, once you begin to dine and feast and eat and go here and there, and you become friends, you become familiar people. You'll not be able to tell the truth. That's why you keep away from all those things so you can stand and teach and preach the truth of the Word of God. But that's not the end of the story. We're looking at verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in, in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the words that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And the, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then he told also to their father. And their father said unto them, which, What way went he? Well, for his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So he saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, I doubt the man of God that came from Judah. And he said, I am. And he said, I am. You know, the word of God tells us that you keep on walking, keep occupied until I come. Be occupied until I come. And the man of God had delivered the word of God. Wonderful. And he had done very well. So far, so good. And then he was going back now, and he said, let me rest. Man of God, is that, is that what the Lord has told you? you? You know, sometimes some people can even be telling you, you're doing nice, you're doing well. You're only five. This is great. When are you going to rest? Well, you rest when the Lord tells you to rest. When the Lord says that's enough. When the Lord says come apart and rest a little and rest a little while. But if the Lord has not said that, and you're resting by the way. And then eventually the old prophet came and he said, Are you the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Oh, and he said, I may not return with thee to go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For so it was said unto me by the watch of the Lord, Thou shalt not thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. Don't you have fellowship with other prophets? I am a prophet also as thou art. Don't you have the spirit of unity? I am a prophet as thou art. Don't you share fellowship with other people, other prophets like you are? Yes, we can share fellowship, but we are listening to the Lord. We have never met. How is he to an old prophet there? And the king is doing that evil thing, sacrificing. And the Lord could not send you to that prophet. And God had to bring the young man, the young prophet, out of another city to come and tell the king. If you are a true prophet, 
and we're all fellowship together. Why is it you didn't have a message of repentance unto that king in your city? But you know the young prophet, he was taken in by that lie. Watch and pray. I pray God will protect you. And then we're told in that, that's in the next verse now, when he said, it was a prophet in verse 18, and he said unto him, I'm prophet as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Have we found any angel talking to him? Who talked to him? I said, who spoke to this old man? His sons spoke to him about what the young man did and what he said. And he told the sons, saddle me the ass. There's no presence of an angel and there is no coming of any, any appearance of any angel. And then it says, an angel told me, bring him back, was he, into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But, what? What? Old prophets, they tell lies. And you cannot tell, looking at their face, they tell their lies confidently. They tell their lies assuredly. They tell their lies boldly, convincingly. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. What's the consequence of that? Verse 23, and it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to which for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast by the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. You will not stop your journey halfway. The lion that is roaming about seeking whom may me devour will not cross your bones halfway. You have left the city of destruction. And you're going to the city of God, New Jerusalem. You will get there. If we're going to get there, the Lord is saying, beware of false prophets. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Beware of false prophets. You know why you came into the Christian fold? You know why you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know why you are born again? You know why you, why you made all those restitutions? And you know why you've been following the Lord in the narrow way, in the narrow path until this time? You know how you, are, how you have been resisting temptation? How you have been faithful until today? Don't allow anybody to stop your journey halfway, to crush your bones, to destroy you, to turn you back from this way that leads unto life eternal. Remain with the Lord. Remain faithful with the Lord. Beware of false prophets. They'll come to you if you don't go to them. They'll send their books to you for some good, good comments. They love you. They appreciate you. They remember you. And they'll tell you, hey, read the book for me so that you'll be able to pass some comments and, and guide me and counsel me. So they lie. They were false prophets. You know the history? They were the people that destroyed the nation of Israel. Beware. Don't think you're too clever, you're too wise, or too sharp, you're too intelligent for them to catch you. They destroyed people who are wiser than we are. They have led astray people who are more serious than we are. Beware. Don't lend them a listening ear. Don't give them any attention. Their history shows us they're very dangerous. They're very deadly. And they want to devour your soul. They want to destroy your soul. They want to damn your soul. Beware. Beware of false prophets. You see their history? See what they've done in the Old Testament? You say they preach and prophesy lies. And they say those lies and tell those lies and preach those lies and proclaim those lies convincingly, courageously. 
for the sake of your soul, for the sake of eternity, the way of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They look so gentle, so meek, so humble. They almost look shy and timid. They look so submissive and so gentle as if this one can never harm anybody. As if this one looks like he has a good intention. Sheep's clothing. But inwardly, that you don't know. Inwardly, inwardly, their motive, their desires, their plan, their agenda is to destroy you. Inwardly, they are reddening wolves. Inwardly, they are aggressive. They may look gentle outside. You need to see how Absalom did it. Absalom was so nice, gentle, loving, caring, humble before the people. But inwardly, that man had a deadly, destructive agenda. We heard about Balaam. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? The Lord has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Let me die the death of the righteous. Let my end be like his. But he was one that counseled Balak to put something blood before the children of Israel. And he committed adultery, fornication, immorality, and thousands of them perished. And they looked so gentle on the outside. They looked so nice. When they come to you, look at the old prophet. An angel spoke to me to bring you back. And that man of God couldn't say, God does not contradict himself. He says, I'm God, I change not. I will not alter what has come out of my mouth. The Lord told me not to go back. How can he change like that and not tell me? And he went back with him. And then the lion crushed him, destroyed him, killed him. Before he got back home, stopped his journey halfway. Pray that the Lord will make you vigilant. That you will not stop this your Christian journey halfway. That you will not listen to the voice of the false prophet. No matter how tempting, how charming, how eloquent, how sweet. We we'll take heed to the words of Jesus. Beware, beware, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, the secret hidden purpose. The Arabian wolves. The Lord loves us. That's why He's giving us the warning. Listen to the voice of Lord. To the warning of the shepherd. The way of false prophets.